I think this video is a really good example of someone who I think is really trying her best to be unbiased. Falling short, falling a little short. Debunking milk myths by How to Cook That and Reardon. And many of you have asked me to touch on this. If you hear stomping, it's my kids, of course. <laughs> I should say that I watch How to Cook That. It is the only like non-vegan food-based channel that I subscribe to and regularly watch. Number one, I really like her cake fails videos where she looks at people's fails, their cake fails, and shows creative ways that they could have fixed them. And number two, her debunking videos, mostly debunking like five minute crafts and all these kind of content farms, these fake life hacks and stuff, and she'll actually try them out and show that they don't work um, and show that how some of them could actually be harmful. And her production value is just through the roof. Her care, again, the amount of time and effort she puts into not only like testing out these hacks, but explaining exactly why they don't work. She is a food scientist, so she's very good at explaining the science behind these hacks, these crafts, and exactly what's going on and why it's not doing what they say it's gonna do. But this is more, I think, a more general video debunking milk myths. She had one on gluten a while ago and gluten-free that was overall really good, if I remember correctly correctly. She talked about the science of gluten, which was very cool. She also talked about like vegan mock meats, uh, gluten-based, you know, mock meats and what exactly they are and kind of how they work, again, from a, from a food science uh, perspective. Very cool. So I'm guessing this is going to be overall pretty good and pretty unbiased, just given all the other videos I've seen from her. If I had to guess, I would guess that there's not going to be much about animal welfare, the, the thing that I care about. I'm sure I'm going to agree with her on the health aspects. Um, I'm not one of those vegans who think that all animal products are just like supremely unhealthy. I think that's nonsense. I'm guessing that there's going to be little regard for animal welfare, but maybe not. Let's find out. Oh, there you can see in the video, food scientist, dietitian, and pastry chef. So I didn't know she was a dietitian. Very cool. What type of milk should you be drinking that is best for your health, best for the environment? There are so many videos out there already that say stop drinking dairy, including this one from Food Theory, which is very, very similar in the look of the thumbnail and the content of the video to this one that was from Brew two years earlier. Wait, Food Theory? Is that like game theorists? Is that the same people? The first argument against milk is out of concern for the cows themselves. A little while ago, there were some videos that came out. Okay, so I was wrong. Why do I always do that? Why do I always start if it's a video I haven't seen with like, I think it's going to be this. I mean, I guess I'm usually right, but wow, I am... Wow, I'm very impressed that we are one minute in and she is starting with cow welfare. There were some videos that came out with undercover footage from some of the dairy farms showing cows being really mistreated. I'm not going to show you the footage because it was quite disturbing and then sick and injured cows not getting veterinary care, not being looked after and as I said it's quite disturbing and I think everyone would agree that's not okay. It certainly would be illegal to treat animals like that here in Australia. So yes there is undercover footage in various animal industries, animal farming industries, showing practices that are not legal which is why I prefer to focus on industry standard practices, the things that are illegal and the things that the industry on the whole allows and does on a regular basis. Things like if we're talking about chickens de-beaking, culling the male chicks and killing them in really horrible ways. And the dairy industry is no exception. There are so many practices inherent to the industry that I think you would be hard pressed to find a person who would honestly say, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's not cruel. Putting them in tiny spaces surrounded by their own filth, no, nah, that's fine. Killing them off once we have no more use for them, once milk production drops, no, nah, that's fine. Point is, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right, doesn't mean it's ethical. We do not have to consume milk to be healthy. There are plenty of food alternatives. And so choosing to do so, choosing to support such a harmful practice is unethical. The other thing that people are concerned about, which is not so much the cruelty of the treatment, but the way they're treated. So in order to produce lots of milk, the cows are impregnated every year. The calves are then taken away and fed separately rather than being able to feed off the mother cow. And people don't want that. They, they want the idea of the cow just being able to go out in the paddock and the calf being able to drink from the cow and then we still get the milk. But 
In reality, if you did that, you would need three times the number of cows in a herd to get the same amount of milk as you get if you do it the way they currently do it. So that would obviously increase the cost of milk a lot. So I actually have a video that partner and I worked on years ago, and it was a lot of work, about ethical milk. Could milk actually be produced ethically? And yes, I believe it could, but it would be insanely expensive, particularly when it comes to keeping the animals alive, right? Not just killing them off when milk production drops, but actually continuing to care for those animals. Milk would be insanely expensive. Again, if you want more detailed information on that and all my calculations and stuff like that, you can go check out that video. But again, milk is unnecessary, so it doesn't really matter <laughs> if it's more expensive. For 99.9% .9 of us, we do not need to drink milk. We do not need to eat dairy at all. And those like actually humane and actually ethical dairy farms do not exist. So please stop drinking milk. There are dairies around that do ethical farming or farming where the cows are left with their calves. And so if you do a bit of Googling, you'll be able to find a dairy that does that. They are likely better than, likely much better than your factory farmed dairy. Number one, you're not on the farm. You don't know exactly what's going on with these animals. And number two, anytime you commodify an animal, anytime you turn a sentient feeling being into a product, you run the risk of caring more about profit than you do animal welfare. That's one of the reasons why we are in the situation we are with factory farming. When you want to make as much food as possible and you want to make as much money off of that food as possible, you have to care about animal welfare as little as possible. So certainly if you're going to drink milk, try to find the most ethical milk you can, but I think you're fooling yourself if you are 100% comfortable doing so and 100% sure that it's actually ethical milk or you could go to milk alternatives. I found this video very interesting. It said that if we all just asked for milk alternatives in our coffee instead of dairy milk, that it would stamp out the practices that we just talked about at farms. But if you just add one extra word, you say, I'll have a soy latte, I'll have an oat latte, I'll have an almond latte, or one of the endless milks that now exist, all of that disappears. Your name is no longer attached to that immorality. It's gone. So the only dairy we consume is milk in coffee? What? <laughs> in reality, since 1975, the consumption of milk in the US, of liquid milk, has decreased 40% since 1975, and the consumption of milk alternatives has gone up. But as a whole, the dairy consumption has gone up. So that's mainly due to an increase in the amount of butter and cheese and yogurt that's being consumed. So if you decrease this, but then you eat your dairy instead, that makes no difference to the cows. They still have to be milked to make those products. So if you are seriously concerned about the cows, you'd have to stop all dairy in your diet. Which may be difficult to do. One of the things people often complain about with with veganism is lack of cheese, <laughs> lack of like good vegan cheese. But we don't need cheese certainly to be healthy. We don't need any dairy products to be healthy. So if you really do care about cows, then yeah, you should give up all dairy. Unless you have like a backyard cow that you milk yourself. <laughs> so if you are seriously concerned about the cows, you'd have to stop all dairy in your diet, not just switch the milks. And then the cows don't get to frolic in a paddock with their calves and live happily ever after, there would be no dairy cows then. They wouldn't be needed anymore, so they just wouldn't exist. So if that appeals to you, go for that. If you like the idea of them frolicking in the fields, go for a boutique dairy and Google search and find one of those near you that you can go and buy and pay the premium price. Maybe one of the best arguments, I don't find it convincing myself, but maybe one of the best ones for this uh, idea, this idea against veganism that going vegan would lead to species extinction and that this is ultimately a moral harm. I would check out Ethics and the Beast, I believe it's called. And I believe that's where the term uh, like tentative vegan comes from. But again, I do not find that convincing myself. I do have a video on veganism and species extinction where I argue that number one, getting rid of dairy and all animal products very likely would not get rid of these animals because they're already in zoos. <laughs> they're already in captivity. Yes, there are cows in captivity. And also people have many of these animals as pets. Granted, there aren't very many pet cows, but there are certainly a good number of pet pigs, pet goats, pet chickens. And the other argument is that ultimately what we're talking about here is breeds, not really species. Uh, and it's, it's ultimately, I think, a really uncomfortable argument to make. 
against veganism or even for veganism. I don't think a species in itself has inherent value. Again, you can check out that video for my full argument. So now it looks like we're moving on to nutrition. Just want to say again, I'm so stoked that she started with animal welfare. Obviously, I had a lot to say. <laughs> really, really happy that she opened the video with that. Why do we even drink milk? Well, milk is currently one of the most widely produced foods in the world. It's used worldwide. And the reason why is because cows have a different digestive system to us. They can eat foods that we can't eat. So things like hay and grass, so something that's inedible to us, they can eat that and turn it into something edible. Which is very useful in certain countries where they don't have access to insane abundance of foods like we do here in the US and in Australia and the UK and other industrialized nations with our amazing grocery stores and also factory farmed cows that the cows we are consuming and getting our milk from are not just living on foods that we can't consume they're eating a lot of soy which we absolutely can consume. If you are growing plants for every hundred kilos of plant food grown there is 37 kilos of byproducts or waste I guess you'd call it that currently gets fed to cows because they can eat that. Same as the skins that are taken off the soybeans that get sent for livestock food. So I talked about this in a recent video. I think it was responding to what I've learned. His beef is good actually video <laughs> and is good for the environment. Just because a food is a byproduct does not mean that we cannot consume it. Byproduct does not necessarily mean waste product. Again, much of the food going to cows and other animals is food that we can consume. There is no question that a plant-based diet is far more efficient than an animal-based diet. You are taking food that we could eat and feeding it to another animal. It is just inherently more efficient unless you are living on you know, more intensive foods, like, I don't know, lettuce, certain fruits, <laughs> and like, yeah, sure, you could always, you could create a really weird plant-based diet that is super intensive, but that's not what vegans are eating, most of us. Our diets are focused on grains and legumes, foods that are much more efficient than animal products. The other thing a lot of people say is, well, maybe we should just swap the land that all the dairy cows are on and plant crops on it and we should all just eat the plants but the trouble with that is two-thirds of the land that the cows are on is not suitable for plant crops it either doesn't have enough rain and water where it is or it's too rocky or too hilly it's not suitable for plant crops so a lot of countries are just clearing more forest to make room for more plant crops which is obviously not a good end result of what we want to do so number one i've talked about this before uh, it's not true. But also I find it so interesting that she brings up clearing forests and doesn't mention that much of the forest being cleared for soy, for instance, the soy is not going to us. Once again, it is going to farm animals. If you care about rainforest deforestation, you, you should try to eat less animals. The reason that milk and dairy have their own food group is because there's something that they are a very good source of. That's the same with all the food groups. The reason it's separated is not just for fun, but each one of those provides a group of nutrients that it's very good at providing and the others are not so good at. To be clear, views on this have changed dramatically over the last, I don't know, decade or so. Harvard Health, for instance, they have their own a healthy plate, Harvard plate. One of the differences between it and like the USDA food pyramid or food plate is that they really do not push milk consumption, dairy consumption. You can see here, they don't even have a section for dairy. It's vegetables, fruit, whole grains, healthy protein, healthy oils, and water. They even suggest limiting milk, milk and dairy products to one to two servings per day. Part of the reason why is because there are better ways to get enough calcium. Many dark leafy greens, the ones that are low in oxalic acid, are great sources of calcium and provide many other benefits that milk does not provide, like fiber, which Americans, Australians, virtually everyone in the industrialized world uh, struggles, struggles with, struggles to get enough. One glass of cow's milk, this size, 250 mils, has in it 300 milligrams of calcium. 
Now if we look at this video from Food Theory, they're telling us some other places that we can get that calcium from. If the primary reason you're drinking milk is to get calcium and vitamin D so you can grow bigger and stronger, consider ways to get the same or her better nutrition with less controversy and less money. Green vegetables like broccoli and kale, more calcium than milk. If you hate green things, just try eating some beans. You know, those fun little round guys that come in burritos and chili? More calcium than milk. Yep, I was surprised too. Number one, just the difference in presentation. I, I think you can probably see why I like Ann Rudin over something like food theorists. It's like the music and the voice. I, it's just like not for me, whereas she is much more chill. There's no music. There's no obnoxious music in the background. But yes, this is really interesting to see. I don't know what food theorists, I don't know if it's like a pro-vegan thing, but you often see this from vegans will, where they'll show these really goofy comparisons like, wow, look how much calcium you can get from cilantro. It's got more calcium than milk. And it's like, yeah, but how much do you have to eat? It's great to talk about calories and nutrients per calorie. Nutrient density is very, very important, but we need to be a little more careful when we're making comparisons like that and make it clear that broccoli has 20 grams of protein and 100 calories, but you have to eat three pounds of it. No, it doesn't have 20 grams of protein and 100 calories. Oh shit, now I gotta look it up. Okay, so 300 calories, 318 calories has 21.6 grams of protein. That is 32 ounces. So that is two pounds of broccoli, of cooked broccoli. I mean, you could eat that, but I get who, no. Also has 362 milligrams of calcium. Again, no thank you. I'm assuming that's basically what she's going to say, that you have to talk about grams. You have to talk about what the stuff weighs, how much you have to eat. And they show a picture of cabbage, not kale. So I guess we'll do kale and cabbage because I'm not sure which one they meant. <laughs> Wait, did he say kale? Broccoli and kale. I don't feel so comfortable getting nutrition advice from someone who doesn't know the difference between cabbage and kale. That's just kind of one of my rules. To get that 300 milligrams of calcium that you get in one glass of milk, you would need to eat 222 grams of kale. And you might think, that's easy, I eat that much in a day. But I can guarantee if you put that in front of a child, that is a lot of kale. She is a mom, uh, so I'm not too surprised she's bringing up kids, I guess. But I do love to see that because that is not represented very well in the vegan world. Not as much discussion about kids' health, vegan nutrition for kids, if you want to feed your kids vegan. Partially because a lot of the like vegan influencers are young and don't have children themselves but also some of them who do recommend some not great stuff. Like they just feed their kids lots and lots of vegetables and no like fortified vegan drinks, no fortified soy milk or very little of those things, but even for a, an adult. And again, you would want to cook that, which would improve absorption of calcium, but even still that is a lot. And also the cost, <laughs> kale is not a cheap vegetable. That's quite a lot. Now, technically, Gram for gram, this has slightly more calcium, but to say that it has more calcium than milk is a bit deceptive because a serve of kale is not this much kale. Again, I wish she would have cooked it because it does reduce dramatically. It is still a lot and more than most people would eat in like a serving. It really does reduce the volume by a lot. If you've ever cooked kale or spinach or any leafy green, it's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing how much it reduces in size. Next, they had broccoli. You would need to eat 960 grams or nearly a kilo of broccoli to get the same amount of calcium as you would in this glass of milk. Again, cooking would help dramatically, but that that is a lot of broccoli. Like when I cook broccoli for the four of us, for me and my partner and my two little kids, that's about how much I cook for all of us. 860 grams of cabbage. That's a lot of cabbage. <laughs> and one thing they forgot to mention or they didn't know, I'm not sure which, is that cabbage contains oxalates and red kidney beans contain phytates. Both of those things decrease the amount of calcium that you can absorb from that food into your body. That's enough cabbage to get the same amount as in one glass of milk. So I don't know if that's true or not specifically for cabbage, but again, uh, the fact she's showing it raw, it's a better visual, right? But but most of the time when we eat cabbage, it's not raw, maybe in a slaw or something. But yeah, it's going to decrease significantly in volume if you cook it. It would still be an insane amount. But again, I'm not sure how true that is in terms of 
cabbage specifically in calcium absorption and, and oxalate content. But she is right that there are certain greens that seem like they're very good sources of calcium if you just put them into uh, some sort of, you know, database chronometer or whatever, and you look at the calcium content, it looks like there's a lot, but that is not taking into account oxalate content, which if it is in high enough amount, significantly reduces calcium absorption. Jenny Messina, the veganrd.com has a really uh, helpful list of more suitable greens, greens that have lower amounts of oxalate acid and higher amounts of calcium. Oh, there's many red kidney beans. That's a heavy plate. And these ones as well, I used them in the equation. So that's your serve of red kidney beans to get your calcium. That again is a very stark comparison. I don't know how accurate that is. Certainly from what I know, beans are considered not a terrific source of calcium. Although soybeans seem to be an exception, absorption seems to be better for those. Same with nuts and seeds. They also don't have great absorption rates of uh, calcium, but it does help if you soak them. But I think her ultimate point still stands, which is that it's much easier, certainly for kids, but even for adults to drink a glass of milk than it is to eat two pounds of broccoli. Thank God we have calcium fortified vegan milks, which I assume she's gonna talk about next. What about your milk alternatives? Naturally, these are not high in calcium. So legally they have to be fortified, which means calcium is added to them during the processing. So if you have a look at the nutritional information panel, you'll see each of these has at least 300 milligrams of calcium per glass. So you can choose to drink dairy milks or milk alternatives and there is enough calcium in them for you. I don't care which one you have as far as calcium is concerned, doesn't matter. But if you're making your own nut milks, particularly if you have kids at home, you need to figure out where they're gonna get that calcium from. Again, there are some vegans who make their own nut milks and have children and just feed those nut milks to their children. Again, you don't have to consume milk. You also don't have to consume milk alternatives. Even kids don't. Kids could theoretically get enough calcium from other vegan foods, but it's gonna be a lot harder. I certainly do not just rely on vegetables and beans and whatnot <laughs> to meet my kids' calcium needs. They consume fortified soy milk every single day. For myself either, what am I saying? I don't just rely on greens and, and beans to meet my calcium needs either. I consume calcium fortified soy milk or pea milk, sometimes almond milk, whatever, almost every single day, if not every day. Okay, the next nutritional concern is saturated fat. Saturated fat is of concern because it's been shown time and time and time again in studies that it's not good for your cardiovascular health or your heart health. So not surprised at all that someone as smart as she is <laughs> does not believe in the whole saturated fat is good actually. Next she talks about milk allergies and lactose intolerance. Interesting, you know, sharing the, the science behind that and what exactly is going on when you have a lactose intolerance. I'm not sure what exactly that has to do with debunking milk myths. She didn't mention any like myths regarding allergies. I don't know, just general information, I guess. So now we're on to the environment. Uh-oh. Which one of these milks is best or worst for the environment? Interestingly, this is such a complicated equation to work out because there are so so many factors that go into making a product there are so many factors that go into this equation that i'm 100 percent convinced you could manipulate that data to make either one of them look better absolutely you could which is why you want to choose reputable sources one of my favorites is Our World in Data. They have shown themselves time and time again to be unbiased when it comes to information like this. They have a great report, Environmental Impacts of Food Production. Cow's milk has significantly higher impacts than the plant-based alternatives across all metrics. It causes around three times as much greenhouse gas emissions, uses around 10 times as much land, two to 20 times as much fresh water, and creates much higher levels of eutrophication. If you want to reduce the environmental footprint of your diet, switching to plant-based alternatives alternatives is a good option. This may be complicated for Anne and something that she herself can't figure out because this is not her area of expertise, but it doesn't mean this work hasn't been done and it doesn't mean that people haven't tried their best to figure out which items are better and it is clear as day that vegan alternatives to milk are much better in terms of environmental impact. Honestly, I think that it's a really, really complicated 
equation and as I said you can actually find dairies that are very efficient and have a low environmental impact. Okay but if you want efficiency if that's what you're looking for is just efficient dairy uh, you want factory farm dairy. There is nothing efficient in terms of production about having a few cows on a lot of land. You cannot produce as much milk. You are using more land, you are using more resources per gallon of milk, per liter of milk, which is why when it comes to food, we need to take it all into account, not just nutrition, not just environmental impact, but also animal welfare. And there's no question that when it comes to dairy, that the alternatives, the vegan alternatives, are better when it comes to environmental impact and animal welfare. Now, nutrition, <laughs> a lot of the vegan cheeses are just coconut oil and starch. I don't think anyone would say that's healthy, much like you don't have to eat cow's cheese to be healthy. You also don't have to eat daya cheese to be healthy. So there's not really one that I can pull out for you and quite confidently say is better for the environment. But what I can tell you is something that makes a huge difference is the packaging that you buy your milk in. If you buy it in these Tetra packs, it has a lot less of an environmental impact than if you buy it in the PET bottles that haven't been made from recycled PET. If it's been made from recycled PET, it has a lesser impact, but not as low as your Tetra packs. So if possible, if you can make a choice about the packaging that it comes in, then that could be making a good environmental impact. Yes, but it is still not as much impact as just avoiding cow's milk completely. I find it so interesting that she's more interested in the plastic and in the packaging. Maybe that's because you can still consume cow's milk if you just change the packaging. If you have to choose between cow's milk packaged in recycled material or whatever and vegan milk that isn't, choose the vegan milk. I hope that helps. It's an unbiased look at all the different milks and you can make your own decision about which one you choose. The truth about biased and unbiased is that we can try our best, <laughs> but often we are still biased. I am biased towards veganism. I do the best I can to be unbiased. I'm better than most. Again, I will readily, readily admit that you can still be healthy eating animal products, which is like blasphemy, right? You just, you cannot say that. But still, I am absolutely biased towards animal liberation. I don't don't want people consuming animals or consuming their byproducts because 99% of the time it is very harmful to animals when we do this. Backyard chickens aside. <laughs> and I think this video is a really good example of someone who I think is really trying her best to be unbiased, falling short, falling a little short particularly on the environmental front. It is it is very clear that cow's milk is worse than vegan alternatives. And seemingly having no interest in looking more into factory farming and what is involved, inherent practices, the okayed, the allowed practices by the in industry and by our governments. Maybe she just really doesn't know or maybe there's a lack of curiosity there because Clearly she herself has no interest in giving up cow's milk and going vegan. And clearly she is incentivized, financially incentivized to not go vegan. I'm not saying for sure that that's a factor, but her channel is very heavily reliant on dairy and eggs in particular. A lot of the food hacks she does are dairy and egg related. She just put out a dessert book that is certainly not vegan. It would be very awkward for her to then <laughs> decide to go vegan right after publishing this book. Okay, there's stuff going on. I think, I think someone needs my help maybe. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, of course, I'm still an Anne Reardon fan. I will continue to watch some of her stuff, the, the, you know, debunking stuff and the cake fails, of course. Thanks to everyone who recommended it. Pregnancy sweats. Like it's not hot in here. I know it's not hot in here, but I'm all sweating like crazy. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, like it. If you want to subscribe, that's awesome. You can click the bell if you want to be notified when I I upload. Thank you so much to patrons at patreon.com slash unnatural vegan for supporting the channel. I post two exclusive videos there a month for $5 plus patrons just talking about stuff, pregnancy updates, whatever is going on with me. You know, they're just little kind of vlog, vloggy videos, I guess. And yeah, thanks again. New video soon, maybe. Why did I clap right next to the microphone?